the first question that, or at least my favorite question, is very much your story, right? This is all, you know, the whole the whole idea behind this initiative is, is sort of your background, your story. And I know a little bit from your book as to, you know, the story of tenure, etc. But I'd love to understand a bit more as to how improv acting came, uh, how, how improv even came about uh, and, and how did you get good at it, uh, you know, it, the, the whole sort of background story to, to, to uh, you know, to this wonderful book that uh, was 20 years in writing would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I, I like to tell that. It's, um, I was a drama teacher. Yes. For, um, that's really um, what my career has been since I was in my late 20s. I started as an actress and I realized I loved teaching and um, I had the good fortune to be invited to come to Stanford. So I found myself at Stanford as the head of the acting program, and my job was to try to train these very smart young people, people who could do anything. They're, they, uh, to get into Stanford, you have to be really smart. I could never have gotten into Stanford, I have to tell you, though. <laughs> Not that smart. So I was trying to figure out, um, I discovered that they were very good when I gave them a script. Yeah. And them what I wanted to do. They yeah. could produce any result if I told them in advance. Yeah. But if I said to the same actor, well, what do you think? How do you feel if you were in that situation? What would you do? I discovered that they just didn't have a clue because there wasn't a, a right answer. Mm -hmm. I needed them to be listening to their own voice. So, um, and my students were not very good at that at all. So I had to find some way to help my acting students um, be alive, be human, be able to be spontaneous. And um, at that point in my life, the, the idea of improv sort of entered because my Tai Chi master, a man named Al Huang, invited this wonderful character, Keith Johnson, and uh, gave some improv classes, and I read his wonderful book, Impro, and I discovered there was a different way to do things besides the uh, plan and execute and memorize your lines and do everything by the book. And then began to play with the improv games and learn how they worked and how they sort of just allowed you to be free, the more useful they became. And hmm. my students loved it at Stanford. It was a, how, how about a class where every answer is right? They were never wrong very liberating because more important than the content was their ability to be honest, be fresh, use what was right in front of them. So these improv games began to help my Stanford actors considerably. And, and what I discovered is a lot of my students were not going to ever be actors. They were in acting classes to be better lawyers and business people. And, and uh, many of them came to me and said, you know, this improv stuff, it's got applications beyond just the acting classroom. You should teach a class for adults. And I was invited to do that for Stanford's continuing studies and then Silicon Valley software engineers and re retired librarians and uh, all sorts of people showed up. And I discovered that these improv games that are sort of designed to help actors had an enormous um, liberating experience for people um, of all ages and that uh, I started being invited without trying to come to the School of Engineering or the School of Designs, business school. Let's, we want some of this improv and um, that's sort of the story goes from there and I never set out to become a, an imp or the person who knows most but Everywhere I turned, I, people asked me, please teach an improv class for us, or we, we, need, we need your help. And finally, uh, the students in my adult class said, you know, you really should write a book, because there's um, what you have to say uh, is valuable. So I started back in, um, it was actually 19, about 80, 89, uh, working on the book. And it took almost 20 years, which is odd, considering it's a book on improv. So you, I should be able just to dash it off. But the reality is that improvising is a way of doing something, but it, it, sometimes an improvisation can take a long time.
depending on what it is. So. Um, right. Uh, so 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 my next question is, I mean, you know, I, I think I think what I like was that there was a lot of stuff that was not necessarily new. But but at the same time, it was it was a different spin to things, right? And I think uh, one of the more provocative stuff is don't prepare, uh, oh. uh, right? And 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 I'm guessing it's it's something to be thought of in a bit of moderation, right? That you do need to prepare, but don't sort of overdo it and don't be over self conscious. So how do you how do you get get this point across to your students? And especially you know the type A students that you're like likely to kind of get get in Stanford, right? So so how, how do you how do you get that across? Well, you're absolutely right. I, I really don't mean don't prepare. What I mean is prepare, prepare, prepare all your life. Prepare up the, uh, up the wazoo. But when you get there, when you show up in the room, don't do your notes. Yeah. Be awake. So that, that preparation is, uh, is fine, but many of us do our preparation instead of um, really other people with with an interview with a class we we read our notes rather than looking at the the human souls around there and use the preparation the stuff that we have learned to um, to begin the conversation I hmm. think it's be partly because we all want to look good everybody is scared of uh, looking silly or not or looking like they don't quite know but you know the truth is we don't mind if someone doesn't have the perfect answer if they're natural and honest. And much more important than getting it right, I think, is being real. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a great advocate for being who you are, making mm -hmm. mistakes, of course. I noticed that on your website, you're a, you're a supporter of that idea. That, uh, Absolutely. Um, yeah. And it's not like I'm going out, I'm setting out to make a mistake. I'm trying to do something stupid in this interview. What it is, is what I'm trying to do is whatever I need to do, and on the road to doing that, uh, I may stumble, I may have to correct myself, I may search for a word. Um, I'm less concerned about a smooth outcome than I am about being honest and real and trying to answer the question or solve the problem. Right. And Right. So, so you, you're, I mean, you know, I'm trying to imagine this is almost the exact opposite of what we learn in school. Right. So so you're, you're obviously a class that is almost in contrast to, to everything else. So so what is the hardest principle that you find? Uh, what, what 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 takes students the longest to get on average? Well, it's a really good question. It may be the idea of giving up control. Hmm. When you're really improvising, you have to let go. You might say most of us are working toward a particular desired outcome. I want to, I want to close the sale. I want to impress Rohan at how brilliant I am. There's something that I'm trying to accomplish in whatever I'm doing. When we improvise, instead of trying to accomplish any particular outcome, we're trying to make sense out of just the next moment. Hmm. And I think that's one of the hardest lessons to learn because if I make sense out of the next moment, you may ask me a question that takes me completely somewhere else hmm. and I'm not, um, I'm not on my mark. Hmm. And um, we don't like being sort of um, unsure. That, uh, but I think that if you study improv, that, that body sensation of, I'm not quite sure where we're going, but it's okay, because we're doing it together, and we've created a, uh, a sense of trust between us. So I'm free to um, muddle along, make some mistakes, and also share this whole thing with you. And that's, that's the difference. Uh, we like to control stuff. So I think giving up control in favor of sharing and in favor of seeing where we go rather than directing an outcome a particular way mm. is one of the big lessons. Okay, it's perfect. So you mentioned in your in your class that you know there are some who are not going to be actors, some are going to be business people, lawyers. How much of improv do you think comes innately, and how much do you think comes uh, from from you know from stuff we learn? The, the old nature versus nurture debate, right? I'm always curious. I think we are natural improvisers. That when we're children, yeah. we 
don't have to necessarily do the perfect um, plan. Yeah. We will pick up a, uh, a cardboard box and turn it into a, a house. Yeah. We'll, we'll use the materials around. We're free to kind of look around and kind of see what's there. Children, I think improvising is the natural state of man. Hmm. What happens? is, of course, that education uh, kind of takes that out of us. They say, no, no, um, lack of preparation is the end of, of, uh, of, of any possibility of doing anything. You can't, you can't go forward if you don't prepare and execute. So our education gives us another message. And I have to say there's, that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes. Because preparing and executing is the way a lot of stuff gets done, and, it, and it's important. But most of us know that, so I don't have to teach that or, or reinforce it. Yeah. And there are times when that's what we fall back on. But a lot of folks are just scared to uh, give it a whirl, to see. Um, there's often a phrase, winging it, when yes. we talk about Im improvising, as if, uh, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm just going to fly into the sky. And winging has a kind of slightly negative Yes. Yes. Um, but if we're really present, yeah. and if we're really seeing what comes next, the result um, is not uh, may not be what we're um, imagining. Yeah. But it's likely to be um, useful and real, and um, so it all it also goes to your question of purpose. To what purpose are we improvising? Exactly. How, yeah. For example, how might you, Rohan, use improvisation? So for me, right, I, I, I find it very, what I liked most was I, I find it very analogous to life itself, right? I mean, I, I think this is what we're doing all the time, or at least we could be doing all the time. And, you know, I, 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 I do a whole bunch of these little things, right? Like my little blog and my little, uh, I, I, I couldn't do them if I was not, if I was waiting for them to be perfect, right? Uh, they're always imperfect. There's always a hundred things I'd love to do better. But it's so much better to just do them because if I was waiting for perfection, I wouldn't be doing this interview with you, right? And it's such an amazing thing to be connecting from, you know, at 7 a.m. here, at 3 p.m. there and, 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 and getting to know you after I've read your book. Uh, so it just feels, um, it, I, I just feel like it's a way of life and, and it's a way of life that I, I obviously uh, completely believe in. And, and, and so at least, at least that's, what, that's how improv resonates with me. Uh, and that's why I'm so keen because I've never learned improv and I'd love to understand, you know, how and, and I'd love to understand if there are three to four things that you tell your students that they could take home or do on a daily basis. And, you know, are there are there little ways that we can get better as improvisers? Absolutely. That's a great question because uh, there's some action items. OK, if there are. Um... There's a wonderful writer named Robert Poynton who wrote a book, uh, Everything is an Offer. It's an improv book. And he says improv can be boiled down to three things. Let go, mm -hmm. notice more, and use everything. Hmm. And in terms of sort of a daily practice, noticing more, to me, is uh, letting go is kind of um, an abstract idea. It's sort of psychological. I'm going to try to not worry about the outcome. Well, mm -hmm. sometimes I worry anyway. But the noticing more is, an, uh, is something we can control and work on. And I would say, um, here's a little exercise, that um, I'm sitting in my office, and I, it's a place I know really well, and I know what's around me and what's in front of me right now. I might want to do a little exercise where I close my eyes right now, and in my mind, I try to create a picture of everything around me in as much detail as I can. And I'm thinking about what's right in front of me and what's behind me. I'm trying to kind of make this picture a three-dimensional. And then I open my eyes and I look around. Mm -hmm. And I check out the difference between what I imagined and what I could remember and what's actually here. Mm -hmm. And I'm often really surprised at what is the real world is mm. much more detailed and interesting. And I, gee, I forgot my iPhone was sitting over to the side. And, yeah. and uh, we, we tend to take a lot of things for granted. So when you're improvising, you want to be noticing more mm. uh, of what's around. So um, paying more attention, trying to add 
in your capacity to notice everything that's going on in the world. We get lazy, I think, because there's a lot of stimulation, that's true. But the more we notice, it's like our stock going up. It appreciates because I'm seeing the detail of the color in the flowers near here or uh, the, the kind of soft quality of your eyes when I look at them. They're very nice, by the way. <laughs> so, noticing more is an exercise that will help us. And the other thing is saying thank you. Hmm. That might sound odd, but I think improvisers, from my, when I teach them, are totally uh, conscious of how much other people are doing for them and, and how much we're being supported. Right now, this amazing uh, internet, this world and, the, and, the, and Skype, our, uh, the app that we're using here, is allowing us to make this magical conversation across thousands of miles. Uh, so there are many people's work that support us right now. And I think an improviser is someone who's always cultivating that muscle of noticing and saying thank you and being appreciative, being grateful for um, the many things that uh, we have all the time. Great. So, so no, it makes absolute sense. And and I guess I guess that my next question would be: I'm sure teaching improv. I mean, I always believe that when you teach something, you learn most yourself, right? Uh, so I'd I'd love to know what, what, how this has changed your life. Like, what are a couple of things that have completely gone or changed since you started doing improv? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that my husband and I um, basically try to adopt these rules uh, in our marriage. So, and it makes it a really great thing because the first rule of improv is to say yes. Say yes to everything. Now, yes. mo most people laugh when I say that. I can't say yes to my husband all the time, golly. But he's saying yes to me, and I'm saying yes to him. And it's here's the rule. We say yes unless there's a really compelling reason otherwise. If, yeah. if I say, hey, let's, um, let's watch this particular TV show tonight, my husband's likely to say yes unless he has another appointment, that he's promised to meet someone, or um, it's not really possible. Um, so that we, we tend to support each other. I think that's one of the ways improvising has made my life a really uh, a happier place um, because there's more, more willingness to try stuff, to do things, to go along, rather than sticking to the preferences that we all have. Because um, I prefer one kind of food sometimes and he prefers another, but um, we share control over that, and it's fun. So... Um, I think improvising, as I'm getting older too, I'm 71 years old, um, allows me to take more chances. Um, mm. Why not? What have I got to lose if I try uh, if I try a new thing or um, uh, go for that skateboard or something? <laughs> uh, that's brilliant. So, so now the next one would be actually we're getting to the almost personal section, right? And uh, it would be great to get a sense of what are your favorite books uh, that, that, that probably you've read many times or have greatly inspired you? Oh, wow. Good question. Um, well, I'm a great fan of a writer named David K. Reynolds. Okay. He writes books on psychology. Um, mm -hmm. the, his, one of his first books was called Constructive Living, and he wrote a book called Playing Ball on Running Water, and Even in Summer the Ice Doesn't Melt. So he's got a bunch of books with water in the title. And um, so the, the psychology books of David Reynolds are, are huge for me. Um, mm -hmm. Keith Johnstone's book, Impro, was uh, really important in me understanding education and something about the uh, improv, the mind of improv. I read a lot of nonfiction. Dan Pink, I'm a, a big fan of his. Um, let's see, I was uh, just reading um, a book by... Uh, Arlie Hothschild about how we are out the outsourced self. Hmm. It's, it's the freshman read at Stanford this year, and it's it's how we've gotten so busy that we're we are outsourcing our 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 lives. We're you know we've got babysitters and we've got matchmakers and we've got wedding planners, and we're getting away from um, doing the things that really um, make life our own. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, been, that's been an interesting thing. I, li I like a lot of um, current nonfiction. Um, I love the poetry of John O'Donohue. He's a favorite writer. 
And um, well, I guess that's that's a few. <laughs> and 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 what about movies and TV shows that that I guess you enjoy and 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 you'd recommend? Sure. Ah, oh, uh, I have to. I, I'm a little embarrassed to say I do watch a lot of television. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, let's see, I'm a fan of uh, Glee, and I'm a fan of Parenthood, and I'm a fan of House of Cards, and uh, I'm a fan of uh, uh, The Mentalist, and I like watching um, um, the PBS um, Masterpiece um, Mystery Series and such like that. I love, uh, I love Ingl the, of course, Downton Abbey and those sorts of shows. Um, are fun. And uh, I have to say, I'm a huge fan of Stanford women's basketball. Ah. We go all the games, and we go all over the country following Stanford women's sports. So uh, I, uh, I share that with my husband. That's wonderful. So, so, so my, my, I guess we're getting to the final two questions. The, 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 the pre-final one would be, uh, what are, uh, you know, little routines, uh, productivity hacks, or little things you do to make yourself, you know, productive, I guess, stay happy. What are these little little ideas that, that you implement? Great. All right. Routines. I make my bed every morning. When I First thing when I get out of it, I make the bed and I put the pillows up and I put the little quilt on the bottom so that it's, uh, there's something about seeing the room uh, nicely folded that makes my day. Another thing I do, which you might find really crazy, <laughs> is whenever, whenever I use a roll of toilet paper, I take the end and I fold it down so that the two ends go into a little triangle. Yeah. The way they do when you go into a hotel. Yeah. The idea of that, of course, is if I finished using it, then someone else is coming next. And I'm trying to think of the next person. So I fold that toilet paper so the next person who finds it, sometimes that person is me, but um, <laughs> uh, it's the idea of looking looking out for other folks mm. um so folding the toilet paper making the bed um i i love to drink earl gray tea every morning and um and and i spend uh, a personal practice is to spend uh, some time every day looking at all i'm receiving from other people so which is a lot i love to write thank you notes and uh, every day i troll the internet to see if anyone has mentioned my book improv wisdom and if they have i send them a personal thank you note so uh, uh, i'm so grateful for for my book has really been alive because people have told it other people mm. uh, there was never any big press uh, release and there were even though it's random house um, it has been a small book that has kind of spread around the world by people like you helping to tell the story. In fact, uh, here it is, uh. of wisdom. Um, it's now in uh, nine languages. Ah, fantastic. They just, they just sold it to uh, a Russian publisher. So uh, it's very, uh, and it's an uh, audio book and also uh, I did the, the reading on the audio book and an e-book too. Yes, so. no, I, I, I always uh, listen to books. So, so your voice sounds very familiar actually after having gone through the book. <laughs> oh, great. You're the first person I've met who has, uh, who I know has heard the audio books. So oh, really? Uh, oh, a lot of my friends actually would read, or, or, you know, we listen to books. So, you know, almost all my nonfiction reading is, uh, is via audio. Great. Oh, well, I'm pleased. <laughs> so, so, okay. So into the final question, what is an idea that inspires you uh, that you'd like to share? Well, it, it may be a repetition of something I've said, but an idea that inspires me is to notice and wake up to the gifts. I think so often we're stuck in our own, um, our own shell, our own ego, and our own desires, and the things that bother us, the things that worry us, that the most important thing I'd like to tell people is to notice how much you're receiving from other people, how your, um, your, your own life is sustained by uh, farmers and uh, people who, who uh, make energy and, uh, and the food we eat and the transportation. If you can fill up with understanding how much, um, how much of a life is already a gift, um, to me that's one of the great things that I'd like to share and pass on.
Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much.